Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Well, welcome to The Total Connector Show. My name is Kay Vandavani. Um, it's a real great pleasure. It's like winning the a small jackpot lottery, <laughs> having Eric Vasquel, uh, Ben Prentice, and Connor Brown together on a panel discussion. This is my second panel discussion with Bitcoin uh, Bitcoiners, Bitcoin maximalists, or I, I call myself Bitcoin realists, but it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Um, now that I you know sort of uh, talked about this, um, let me. Uh, can you guys introduce yourself? while I'm showing a couple of those articles that you published and your background and how you came to Bitcoin just for the newbies. Thank you so much for your time and appreciate for coming. Starts. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah um, Eric Bosco, I, uh, uh, I, let me see. I've been uh, developing uh, on the Bitcoin for about five years. Um, uh, I've done a number of startups. Before that, I was in the Navy, uh, in the U.S. Navy, flew uh, airplanes off of boats, and I uh, got a computer science degree uh, a long time ago for Microsoft as an architect and uh, IBM uh, way back. I guess Is that Eric right there? Is that... Yeah, that's it. You know, I was thinking, is 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 Top Gun's movie with Tom Cruise like sort of based on the authentic story of Eric Roskill? I was thinking, it was like, I mean, I was always like envious of the pilots. Like, I wanted to be a pilot too, but I just didn't have to think for it. You know, probably. The handsome young man right there. Yeah. Um. So, hey everyone, I'm Connor Brown. Um, I'm currently a student at Stanford Law School right now. I'm working. Uh, at a law firm, my interest in Bitcoin was peaked actually when a friend of mine told me to write about, he was like, tell me to get into writing. And uh, he told me to write about blockchain technology since I was at Stanford. And I was like, oh, awesome. Started getting into blockchain. Um, and then, you know, the further I went down the rabbit hole, it was pretty clear that Bitcoin was really the only thing that mattered. Um, and so, yeah, I think that while I don't have necessarily like a technical background from like a computer science perspective, uh, my background's in law, economics, philosophy, all that. And that's, you know, also very important when we're talking about something that's going to change, you know, human civilization <laughs> um, and just the way we store our time and energy and what that means for our society. So, yeah, happy to be here. Great. Ben, go ahead. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Ben Prentice. Uh, I, I I wrote a blog one coin, but um, <laughs> there's some there's some shit coinery in there, so so maybe don't read that. Just follow me on Twitter and reach out to me anytime. I, all I do is I I think about Bitcoin a lot and I talk about Bitcoin a lot, and uh, I uh, I'm I'm slowly falling down the rabbit hole. So come come along in this journey with me. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, guys. Um, I don't want to dictate, you know, the course of this uh, uh, podcast show. I just wanted, you know, I want to create and deliver some uh, content value that is um, for the average person. All right, because I hear a lot of interviews. I hear a lot of podcasts. It's a lot of technical terminology. And to be honest with you, I'm I'm trying, you know, to have empathy with with most people out there who have no clue, you know, uh, especially because it, it's either you are a coder, programmer, cryptographer, or really into the scene, to 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 you know f constantly follow up on on you know on the on the comprehension definition, terminology, or what it means, you know, why Bitcoin, you know, in the overall sense. So I have a couple of topics. Uh, uh, also in connection with, with uh, Caitlin Long's uh, last articles, uh, systemic stability versus price stability, uh, even down to David Bowie's uh, interview in, in 1999, or Connor, Connor Brown's article on uh, you know, intrinsic value, store of value, um, a Libit article by Eric Vosquil, you know, all the, the podcast uh, which uh, Ben Prentice just recently did on Eco Chamber on nation state initiative, like, you know, what would happen if a nation state would go into Bitcoin, at least, you know, uh, uh, fragment, fragmented, uh, fragmented uh, uh, or a fraction of a Bitcoin. 
uh, what, and, and I have my very specific questions, like very practical questions. And I know it's a daydreaming, but I'm so obsessed with this vision, with this uh, wish that what would happen if collectively uh, a critical mass of people would wake up to the facts like, and FOMO totally in and every human, not every human, but let's just say four, 2 billion, 4 billion people all of a sudden wake up to the facts like, hey, I need some Bitcoin and I can do it. You know, there's, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a secret anymore. It's not a rocket science anymore. I think everybody can at least get their hands on 0, 0.00 whatever two Bitcoin. So I know there's a lot of, I don't want you guys overload you, but <laughs> I just want you to sort of uh, co-develop um, this, this uh, course of discussion, panel discussion with me, because uh, there's a lot of, you know, questions out there. There's a lot of, you know, confusion and misunderstanding, miscomprehension, especially when it comes to logical deductions in Austrian economics. And that's where Eric Vosquil with this rigid, strict <laughs> logical reasoning and deduction comes into play. Uh, what do you guys think are the fundamental, my first question, what do you guys think is the fundamental miscon misconception, misunderstanding or non-comprehension when it comes to Bitcoin? Would it be, you know, academics who are totally, you know, with their, who are totally like indoctrinated with their PhD titles and Keynesianism or the average Joe on the street. What is it that, that people do not grasp about Bitcoin as a store of value? Let's just start off with a store of value. <laughs> I, mm. I think people are, people are locked in the status, the tyranny of the status quo that they, it's very difficult to, um, to like, expand your worldview to something that you hadn't previously considered especially if it's you know kind of radical you know you know the the article he has up here is called bitcoin internet and the rock and roll and and, and rock and roll was was radical it was it was kind of revolutionary and and the status quo at the time you know was people saying that oh that's the devil's music and stuff and 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 people are kind of doing that with bitcoin that it's oh it's the devil's the devil's money you know it's used for 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 pornography and gambling and stuff and and to really like to really i think entertain the idea of uh, a world where where people use bitcoin you know a lot is very difficult for people to grasp because it's it's so far outside their realm their 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 worldview where where we just have you know we got these banks they take care of everything we got the federal reserve they take care of everything and to entertain the idea that there's this non-sovereign uh peer-to-peer -peer network of money is, is very, is very tough for people. And, and, and it takes a lot of work, I think, to think about it. I've been spending the last year doing it and I'm still learning every day. So I think it has a lot to do with it. Yeah. I, I think the, the nature of money as um, an evolutionary process is something that's really difficult for people to conceptualize. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they talk about, uh, you know, Bitcoin can never be a store of value because it'll never be a money because, you know, it's too volatile and it can't be used as a medium of exchange. I think that, you know, it's a question of the order that something becomes a money and something doesn't just become a global reserve asset overnight. You know, it has to go through stages and you can't have something go from no value to trillions of dollars in value. And so that is an evolutionary process where it goes from a store of value to slowly becoming more of a common medium of exchange and then a unit of account. I think that, that evolutionary process is oftentimes missed. Um, another, well, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for misconceptions. I think that um, people really want it to be all three things simultaneously from the beginning. And that's, I mean, it's logically impossible for something to become a reserve asset without being extremely volatile in the upward direction. Eric, what do you think? I, I think I think the the main misconception, at least in the Bitcoin community, you know, excluding all the misconceptions of the various blockchain things and shit coins, is that Bitcoin is a white market money. Um, Bit, Bitcoin has no against its primary adversary uh, for control over money, which is the state. Um, it, it never pretended to have, you know, such a security. Um, the people have uh, ascribed their um, desires to it. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, a lot of the effort put into things that 
uh, pertain to Bitcoin um, have no security. Uh, they, they, and they offer none to Bitcoin. And fundamentally, the money is about security and securing it from the control of the state, letting it be independent of those controls. So in my mind, that's the, that's the most important and most significant uh, misconception about Bitcoin, that it is, as you, as you imply with the uh, Bowie article, an act of rebellion like rock and roll or the internet. Um, and, you know, you can't be both um, embraced by the system and rebel from it um, unless the system just doesn't care. And then you're just ineffectual. So um, Bitcoin does necessarily have to go through phases. And the first phase is nobody cares. It's, you know, Satoshi mining in his, you know, garage or something. Uh, and eventually people start to care uh, because it's taking money away from the state. And that's really the idea is to let people keep more of their own stuff. And at some point, if it becomes significant enough, it, the state will care. And, um, you know, they, the easiest thing for, for them to do is to simply say, you can't do this. Maybe you can do this FedCoin thing, which is very similar. But you can't do this Bitcoin thing because it's money laundering. And Bitcoin offers no defense from that. And what it, what it offers is the choice to participate illegally uh, in what I call black market money um, or to stop. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's by far what I think is the biggest misconception about it. Yeah, I wonder, Eric, if we could uh, discuss that a little bit because um, I, I, I've heard you talk about this before and I, I find it very, very interesting kind of paradigm that you're talking about. Bitcoin has value as a black market money and it, it i don't want to mince your words but essentially it doesn't have value as a white market money or, or something along those lines what what is if if governments don't ban bitcoin then does it not have value no it just doesn't it's not having any effect that's what's implied by government saying it's all cool and that's kind of where we are now i mean there are there are certainly people are starting to take some notice but um it's not significant. And I've, you know, I've talked to regulators about it at you know, very mm -hmm. high levels and, and heard them speak. And, and that's exactly what they say. It's not, it's not significant enough for them to care. When, when it starts actually saving people money, you know, tax money effectively through avoidance of the inflation tax or uh, ability to transact more privately, and then, then they'll start to care. And they've said this. So, um, and it's not that it can't have value as a white market money. People, people, people value whatever they want, and it has utility in the white market, so people use it, and it has value. Um, my, my point is that it can't secure that value, right? And uh, which means it can, be, it can be taken away very quickly, um, stroke of a pen. So uh, the only option at that point is to continue to operate illegally, which is what Bitcoin is designed to allow you to do. That's what permissionless means. You do it without permission. I, I guess what I'm tr trying to get at, sorry to, to cut you off there. Uh, I, I'm trying to get at, do you think that the, the threat of it being so viable as a black market money almost prevents them from being able to do anything about it? No. I think that's, okay. that's a, that's a common, uh, I mean, there's several common you know, responses to that, to my observation, or, you know, I don't know if I was the first one to observe it, but um, I think Satoshi at least understood it to some extent. Um, but, you know, the, the, that's the idea that if it becomes so popular um, that the state right. can't ban it. Well, that's, right. I, I consider that absurd. Um, you know, it's possible the state won't ban it, right? I never, I, I don't, Try to make predictions. Let me just explain the model. You know how it works. Certainly, the state can do whatever it wants, and you know voters can do whatever they want. Um, but the idea, you know, basing basing the idea on the fact that it's secured because it's popular, is 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 provably not true. Because um, most things that are banned are the most popular, right? Um, I mean, I, I just I just read an article about San Francisco, you know, banning. Uh, vaping um, or to some extent right yeah. and, the, and, the, and the reason they used was that it was so popular among younger people that's it if it wasn't popular they wouldn't have cared so the most popular things get banned I mean look at the long long list you know historically um, and uh, money's on that list right gold 
yeah. um, very popular at the time. Um, I feel like banning Bitcoin is going to have much deeper repercussions than banning vaping. I mean, vaping doesn't change anything. If you ban Bitcoin and we're right about it becoming a global monetary reserve currency, then, you know, suddenly you're shooting yourself in the foot if you ban it. Like you, the, the game theory where like it's a prisoner's dilemma, right? You have to play or else you're going to see your own you know, wealth just disappear if every if it is this black hole of value. Um, well, you should use gold and not vaping probably as a better example. Very popular sure. money around the world, right? Used by the state um, and eventually banned. Uh, not only banned, but stolen. Um, so so there's existence proofs that show that that's, you know, that, that, that idea that something as popular as the world's money couldn't be banned um, is not, are not true. Um, they've happened. So, but, um, but they still hold it. Absolutely. They didn't, they didn't ban it and then say, and we're not going to touch it. They banned, they banned it, it and took trade it. Trade and contract. So, um, in, as money. So, the, you know, the state reserves for itself the right to do whatever it wants, right? So, what it wants is to be able to control the money um, because it taxes through the money. There's two, two forms of taxation through money. And, you know, one is, the ability to create some of your own and the other is um, the ability to see how people are transacting that transparency that they want so they can enforce other taxes so shooting yourself in the foot you know might be not letting this new technology evolve and therefore the world is poor the state doesn't care the state is after its own revenue not making everybody else wealthy so um, you have to look at it from its perspective not from your own and it has different objectives and things that it thinks are useful are different. So preserving, maximizing tax revenue is the goal of the state. And if it sees that um, letting Bitcoin operate reduces its tax revenue, then it won't. It's, it's, it's against its interest. Um, even if that leads to a contraction of the economy, and we've seen this in very large states, China, Russia, for example, where they uh, decided that the state could be more powerful if we were communists. They didn't care how poor or dead people got. So um, their interest is not our interest, and speaking as individuals. Um, so, you know, if it, if it, if it sees that the, the returns are greater for banning it, which if, if they're not, then what do we achieve? Right? We're not saving some of that tax money for people and making their lives better by avoiding state controls, and we're not accomplishing anything. And that means if they don't ban it, we're not effective. Well, I would push back on that too, Eric. I think um, just some some of the qualities of Bitcoin as a you know a, a like a almost infinitely scalable medium of exchange have value despite you know I I agree with you that one of the main value propositions of Bitcoin is to avoid inflation tax, but that it has other uses too. Um, and Do you believe that, that those uses cannot be achieved without Bitcoin. You believe that the, that the state couldn't allow people to make monies that are not decentralized and secured against these controls? If, I mean, again, we're, 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 we're basically asking the state to give up controls that it could give up if it wanted to and make this as easy as you described with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is actually a very expensive way to achieve these things. That expense is yes. the cost of preventing the state from imposing these controls. It could make a it could allow better money by just allowing a free market for money, allowing it to move across borders without inflation, right? Without taking control over it. Um, and, you know, and you, you look back at like PayPal started out as this company called Confinity and their objective was to circumvent, allow people to circumvent currency controls. Yeah, but they turned into a bank, right? PayPal, you know, their vision was different, but now, you know, they're working well with uh, 30 or 40 bank licenses in different jurisdictions. Their vision yeah, was like, different, right? The point is they failed, right? Mm -hmm. Why did they fail? Mm -hmm. They realized that they had no way to allow them, they had no way to circumvent these controls and continue to operate, right? No, so if the state wanted that benefit of free flowing money around the world without inflation, et cetera, it could simply allow it. It doesn't. So say it's it? in the state's interest because it will make money flow more easily it is, is kind of a clear contradiction. They could achieve that if they wanted to. They don't. I mean, I, I don't know that's if they could achieve it in a way that's better than Bitcoin. I mean, it seems like 
there's a catch 22. If they try to do something better than Bitcoin or as good as Bitcoin, then they have to give up control, which exactly. they couldn't do. Exactly. They won't do, which is right. my point. They won't right. So they can't Bitcoin either. <laughs> right. I'm well, saying, well, <laughs> I, I want to go back to the gold example because you know, you're right that they banned gold, but what they didn't do is they didn't get rid of all their gold. They kept the gold. They didn't need to, to achieve their objective, right? The objective. Well, they had to keep it because if they had got, if they had, like, let's say the United States banned gold completely and said, it's such terrible stuff. We're just going to, you know, do away with it. We're not going to hold it. We're not going to touch it. That would be shooting themselves in the foot. So I think that maybe they'll ban Bitcoin. I can see several countries banning Bitcoin, but I can't see a country saying, um, we're going to ban Bitcoin. And we're, we're never going to be a part of it. They're going to ban it and probably hold it. Well, that, and it, because they can't that, not, right? <laughs> they can't risk it becoming the global reserve asset and they have zero. Okay, if, the, if, if countries ban, if, if the state bans Bitcoin and holds it, what secures it? Why, what prevents them now from saying, well, we've made a few modifications? Nothing. If no, we, the mining, it'll still be secured by miners. They've banned it. They've banned the mining and transacting in Bitcoin. They control it. Now they own it. Okay, well, okay, so are you saying it's going to be, I'm, I don't think it's going to be banned in the entire world ever. Well, well, I know that's what you think, but what we're talking about is, the, is, is, is why, right? Why do you believe that? Because um, there's always going to be a, like, there's always going to be someone who breaks, so you're talking you know, the about, cartel, right? You're talking about jurisdictional arbitrage. Some states right. will be banned yeah. and some states won't, yeah. which is a different idea. And the state wants everybody to be wealthier, so they'll let it continue, which is what we were talking about earlier. Right, so there's a there's this one point on popularity. It's so popular and so useful, they won't ban it. I, I think that's um, not can't predict what they will do. But if it becomes if it becomes useful enough, in other words, it's saving people money and taking it therefore from the state, they certainly have that option, and it's easy. The next uh, point we're talking about is jurisdictional arbitrage. Not every nation state uh, will do this. Well, that's irrelevant. What, when I talk about the white market and the black market, we're, talk, we're simply talking about it from the perspective of whatever state or set of states that are banning it, right? From their perspective, certain other states might be part of the black market. So what? That right. doesn't change the formula. Um, yeah, people, people might go off to, you know, Iran, which is considered a yeah. rogue state today, yeah. and decide that because it's part of the Bitcoin black market from the West's perspective, they'll mine there, right? And of course, mm-hmm. people will mine in the black market. They're doing it illegally from the states that are trying to stop it. And of course, that will continue to work. That's the point, right? Bitcoin can operate in the face of a ban. It just means you're part of that black, that relative black market. The question then is, what does the state do when it realizes it can't control the black market, right? Mm-hmm. It, it uses right. enforcement. And, and yeah. the way Bitcoin has an inherent weakness. It's more easily controlled from one point on the earth than, than any other way, right? Centralized mining is more cost effective. So the, the state will mine it if, it if it bans it and wants to control it and is not effective, right? Is That's, it more cost effective? I mean, yeah, I don't think that it's scale, itself. I think it's, it, it's not knowable. What's more cost effective? What, you know, whether the state feels it's losing more money to Bitcoin than it's losing by subsidizing mining censorship but it has that option right the question of whether it wins that or not is not knowable because we don't know how much people will value getting their transactions confirmed therefore paying for black market hash power in excess of the white market hash power the censored hash power and it's not knowable how much the state would be willing to spend in in tax money to provide that subsidy um, I, I, I'm not, I I'm not suggesting that it wins. I'm suggesting that these are the forces that I'm describing the forces at work. Can I ask I you something? Uh, can I ask you something? If, for example, you know, there's actually, because it's, it's like camouflage, this whole discussion, there's literally uh, a real, not only trade war, but a currency war going on in the background. By, uh, with the intention of circumventing the, uh, the dominant uh, international reserve currency, which is the U.S. dollar. Oh, my God. Are you okay? You just fell off the chair. <laughs> Are you okay? You want to call the ambulance? Stuff the mouse fell off the monitor. Because you guys See, it's always the mouse. It's always the fall. And then my shirt gave out. All right. Back. 
okay, the podcasters cannot uh, see what what is going on. So, <laughs> so back to my question. Uh, maybe it's a really naive question, but do you think um, if if a critical mass, for example, in Venezuela or or Iran uh, would adopt Bitcoin, isn't that undermining the the, the forces or the dictatorship, whatever you want to call it, the regime forces of a specific country? Yeah, of course, undermining, literally, right? Um, or maybe figuratively, uh, but undermining means mining under somebody's mind, right? Um, <laughs> uh, interesting historical uh, word base. But uh, yeah, of course. So the black market, you know, tries to undermine the state. Um, in this case, outmine the state. And it does so by by the fact that when people's transactions don't get confirmed because the state is censoring with the 51% attack, their fees rise on those transactions. The state doesn't take those fees. So it in sense, it, now there's more profit to be made by, by black market mining, by taking those fees. So hash power rises in the black market and uh, the state has the option to either accept those fees or subsidize its hash power with tax revenue. So there's a real cost to um, to maintaining that control and that that censorship over Bitcoin, and the, the question is whether that cost is worth it. That's really not knowable, right? Value is subjective; it's in people's minds. The value of those transactions getting through versus the value of stopping. <laughs> well, I I agree with a lot of what you say about it's it's really unknowable, Eric. I wonder. If you would muse, since you've spent so much time thinking about this, on what you think will happen, even though it's obviously right, unknown. You're make a prediction, aren't you? No, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious if we can explore intellectually some possibilities. Well, and the, 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 the you know, I, I write that uh, Bitcoin is is based on you know three technologies um, or three systems that are axiomatic. You know, praxology um, or axiomatic economics. Um, uh, mathematics, which is again not not consistent and complete, it's axiomatic. And, um, can you define the first two, Eric, for the listeners? Uh, <laughs> before I forget the third, the third is prob probability. Probability. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so you were asking me. Sorry. Yeah, just uh, you know, layman's. I mean, prexology. Okay, so prexology is what we call Austrian economics, essentially, right? It's economics that's based on. Um, a set of assumptions. The first assumption um, is that humans act, right? If they don't, but if humans act, they make decisions. They make decisions based on whatever they make them based on, right? It doesn't matter. Um, and and um, a large part of uh, uh, economic theory or, or uh, praxology uh, flows from that. And there's a couple other assumptions as well. But they're assumptions. You can't prove them. Um, some people refer to them as inherent truths, but those are basically truths that are unproven, right? Unprovable. So mathematics is the same way. Um, and so is probability theory. There's, there's an assumption there that we can accept and move forward or not accept. Um, ge geometry is based on a number of assumptions, one of them being that parallel lines don't meet. Well, it turns out you, you can't really prove that. You just have to assume it. And if you assume that they might meet, you might end up with something like spherical geometry, right? Which is useful on the surface of the earth. So um, bit, bit, the things about Bitcoin that, that matter are based on these three systems, but they're also based on one other assumption that we can't prove. Otherwise, if, if, we, if we didn't make this assumption, it wouldn't be Bitcoin and we wouldn't work on it. Um, and that assumption is that the system can survive, uh, can defeat the state, can't prove it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just described to you why it's not provable, um, but we believe, what we believe it's possible um, we assume it's possible and we move forward from there. I call that the axiom of resistance, right? We assume we can defeat the state. Now, uh, at one point years ago, uh, Mike Kern and I had a discussion. He had discussed it, you know, with a number of people. He didn't believe that Bitcoin could defeat the state. He, he, he said, you know, Bitcoin is, is, at some point, he said Bitcoin is defended by the fact that it's popular. And uh, when that didn't hold up, he just felt that, you know, it, it just really couldn't defeat the state. And he moved on to something else. Right. And that's what you do when you don't accept that axiom. Right. You, you move on to some centralized coin, you work on Ripple or, you know, some <laughs> other some other thing. So. So, again, uh, the, the, whether I can you know what 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 can I predict will happen uh, that, that again, it's it's axiomatic. You can't 
can't say what will happen. All you can say is how it works, and we believe that it's possible, and we can show how it's possible. But we all, in showing how it's possible, we can, we can see that it's not provable. I agree. I agree with all that. I also think that, you know, maybe it's not a question of the state, but it will defeat some states. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's going to come down to uh, uh, some states will, will see the opportunity there and will align themselves with Bitcoin and some states won't. And, you know, maybe in doing so, they in turn basically sanction themselves from the rest of the world and uh, end, up, end up hurting themselves. Um, there's always going to be a black market and white market in relative terms, you know, because any black market and white market is relative. Yeah. Um, the and question is, this, yeah, go, when go I ahead. When I say the state, all I'm referring to is, the, you know, the group of entities that are trying to enforce their controls and, and the black and, and the, you know, the black market is simply everybody else. The white market and the black market is relative to that, to that perspective. It doesn't mean that a state can't be included in the black market. We see that today. Right. Yeah. And, and, and like Bitcoin has allowed us to, to theorize uh, a concept of the nation state that is separate from <coughs> the monetary base, which is a very new idea. I mean, and, and it's similar to, you know, the idea of having the church and the state. Um, and then, you know, once the idea of determining your own religion outside the boundaries of the state, you know, became popular, then that's something that can't really be put back in the bottle. Sure, there's going to be some states that have a state religion, like as we still have today, and there might be still states hundreds of years from now that still have a state-based money um, and, you know, hurt themselves in doing so. But, um, yeah, I think that once the idea comes out, at least some states are going to uh, go with it because it's going to be to their uh, own advantage to be some of the states that... Um, align their interest with Bitcoin uh, as a global asset. I, I'd make, make two comments. I, one is just maybe technical. I, I don't believe that Bitcoin is, is a new concept in terms of state living. So it's before states. Sure. And, you know, gold certainly was a state, is a stateless money. The problem with gold is you can't move it on a wire. So how, yeah, how about digital useful, stateless money? Yeah, it's not useful. Right as useful in a, in a, in a global you know, connected economy. And that's probably why uh, the restrictions on gold were lifted. It was really not relevant anymore. People couldn't use it for most of their activity. Um, and uh, I don't know, sorry, there was another comment I, I, I had, but um, the, the idea, oh, the idea of, of certain states aligning. Yeah, again, not provable what a state will do, um, but, mm. um, we, we see this today where certain states, you know, find it in their interest to, to resist, I don't know, call it the West, right? They become sanctioned, <laughs> whatever, get cut out of the financial system. They do that. They do it for their self-interest. And uh, in terms of money, you, you can count probably on one hand uh, the number of states that don't coin their own money, right? And because there's a tax value for doing that, some of them are so small, it's just not worth it to them. So they use the euro or the dollar, or the rand, you know, um, some of them cycle through using other people's money when their own fails, like Zimbabwe. Um, but um, ultimately, there's you know there's there's demonstrably a, a strong interest in having control over that tax machine. Um, but you know who's to say uh, the black market um, may be big, it may be small. Um, all we all we know is that it has to be uh, enough to overpower the censor. Well, yeah. I mean, even Sorry. Based on what you think of the black market, it, it could be uh, huge from one perspective and tiny from another perspective, depending on which side of it you're on. So, Yeah. I mean, ultimately, all that matters is the financial size of it, right? Um, if people can operate in the black market to the extent where they value transacting to the point where they're going to pay a high enough fee to overpower the censor, then they'll have their money. Exactly. Right. What is that? What is that critical mass, Eric? That you said, okay, there needs to be, you know, certain parameters, conditions met, that the state starts, you know, censoring whatever or going against. But what what, what would be like the, you know, the ideal condition for for the state sort of to 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 come into play and say, I, you know, we got to do something. 
is there a number to, uh, is there put a yourself, parameter or? put yourself in their shoes right you have a certain <laughs> you know rev you have a certain tax machine it's generating a certain amount of revenue and all of a sudden that revenue starts to drop mm -hmm. you, you you're not able to see transactions you see you describe it as money laundering right mm -hmm. money laundering is just a, a way to say you're you're transacting transparent uh, sorry opaquely right? it's mm -hmm. not transparent to the state um so okay there's all this money laundering going on and and um but what you're really saying, that's a euphemism for we can't tax as effectively as we could before. And people are avoiding use of your currency, so they're not, you know, your inflation tax is dropping. And when you see that becoming costly enough and you estimate that the cost of enforcement, whether it's political cost or, you know, monetary cost, um, is less than the, than the, than the cost you lose, than the money you're losing, you, you might consider actually doing something. I mean, a rational actor would. Um, and you can't assume the states are rational from its own perspective. It's very, it's entirely rational from its own perspective. It's just not necessarily our perspective. Well, what if, what if Eric, that they, they are drinking their own Kool-Aid and they really do believe that the Keynesian system is working for people better than gold would have or whatever. And what, you know, it's possible that it's possible, right? It's possible that they could see that this system might actually work better for everybody. Again, but right. everybody is not the objective for the state. Is the right. Objective, right. So, right. Uh, well, in, in theory, it is, though. Right. In, in, in practice, it may not be. In theory, the state's the idea is to protect liberties and to, we wouldn't you know, we would, they would just re realize that all this taxation is not good for people and stop doing it. And, that, and, and again, we have democracies in a lot of these states. Theoretically, the people should be able to do that themselves without having but, to resort to Bitcoin. But I argue that a, a digital secure money couldn't have existed before bitcoin and didn't exist before bitcoin so secured against what secured against the state that's the point right so it could have existed PayPal and, and, existed. and secured against the counterfeiters and secured against stuff not just the state the, the, the market is an effective regulator until the state steps in right so if people make bad if you make private monies and the private money's bad people don't use it so have, it's not necessary to have a decentralized money to have it be an effective, secure, useful money. It's, it's, it's necessary to be decentralized so you can hide, operate at small scale from the state. But the fact that it's decentralized introduces some interesting properties, I think, that weren't possible before, that, that didn't exist property. before. It's a security property. It's anonymity. And, and per permissionlessness, not from the perspective of, you know, you know the state preventing you from doing it so you have permission i'm saying the per permissionlessness of innovation that the innovation can happen at the edges and 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 andreas talks about that that a lot in, in free markets is unrestrained that's 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 the nature of, of markets they can do whatever they want it's but centralized the centralized systems of money aren't able to to allow uh edge innovation it's it's not uh, it's not money how they work unique in that it, it's not subject to market forces right M innovation occurs naturally in the market to satisfy people's desires and demands and the state is what prevents those innovations in the case okay i'm not sure i uh, completely agree but I, I see what you're saying Connor, I'm sorry, I did I interrupt you before? You wanted, we were going to say something just a couple of minutes ago. Um, Connor. Um, I, I was going to say, you know, in, in answer to the question of like what's going to cause states to make this decision on whether or not they crack down on it, I think something that complicates it is that money is a, it's, it's just a very ideological concept. And, and I think a lot of people, regulators or, uh, representatives they don't understand money uh, like at a really foundational level and so they see bitcoin as a payment system and not as a money mm -hmm. and i think that you know it, it's strange because bitcoin represents a massive threat to you know nation states around the world in terms of losing their power to control the money supply which is where a lot of their power comes from but the fact that People believe that money is subjective and, um, and not based on monetary properties uh, causes them to see Bitcoin as just a payment system. I mean, when I first read about Bitcoin for 
months, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, remittances. That's where the value add is. <laughs> I mean, it was like, a, 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 like uh, it, it was just something I could only conceptualize as a form of payment just because you never think on the monetary level. So I think that that, in some ways, that forgetting of what money is and why it's important uh, is really helpful to Bitcoin. It almost provides this cover uh, for it to continue to grow. I mean, if they, if, if there was a deep understanding of money, I feel like this would have been banned five years ago. Um, you know, I don't disagree with you. I mean, people don't understand money. Um, yeah. people don't understand Bitcoin for certain, for sure. Um, and you know, people that operate the state are individually not, you know, not so aware of these things, maybe less than, than most. And it tends to be a slow operating, you know, machine, but, um, that, and I, I think I agree. I think what you're saying is that, you know, because it, because they don't understand it, maybe there's some leeway to operate in the white market right now. Um, but at some point, right, that, that it may be understood that they're losing monetary revenue, um, revenue from the control of money to Bitcoin, whether they understand Bitcoin or not. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And as a result, you know, they may do something about it. I mean, the internet went through this and the internet's not, you know, decentralized or, or secured from the state in the same way as, as Bitcoin. Um, but there was this kind of explicit, uh, there was an explicit uh, kind of um, safe harbor from taxation, at least in the United States for a period of time where anything bought on the internet was tax free, right? That's mm -hmm. gone now. Um, that lasted quite a long time. And that allowed, um, you know, purchases made over the internet that used to be made over the phone or, you know, this is how the Sears, Sears got started, right? They, they started selling catalogs and selling stuff, uh, shipping catalogs and selling stuff over the phone to people that were, you know, uh, setting up uh, homesteads in the Midwest and, you know, which was growing like crazy, but there were not a lot of stores out there. So they, they, they created mail order and it was huge, right? But um, the internet kind of came along the same way and said, well, we can, we can, we can subvert that whole mail order thing. And by the way, there's no tax, no tax on these purchases. So great, a great safe haven for a period of time allowed it to grow. Maybe, maybe analogous. Um, but when the, when tax, when, when sales started to get to the point where not only a lot of sales were happening, but the majority of sales were happening over the internet, guess what we got? We got tax, right? So mm -hmm. we had no security model against that. Um, and uh, Bitcoin similarly has no security model uh, against white market forces either. People can still buy things illegally over the internet. They can still that, and and you know they suffer the cost of enforcement. Uh, and people will be built, be able to do the same with Bitcoin. So I agree with you. Just uh, just adding some just yeah, yeah. color yeah. and, and uh, some more observations. I thought we were going to talk about David Bowie. And <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> punk, uh, what do you call it? Anico, anico pop, anico punk, anico art. But it's a really, I mean, uh, uh, we were talking before the interview, uh, before it kind of came on uh, uh, with Ben and Eric um, about, I remember I, I saw recently the, the other interview from of 99, because the interview is from uh, 99. And I found it hilarious because this uh, another interview took place with Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, you know, with the same mindset of a journalist, not understanding what Jeff Bezos' vision, you know, he was trying to say, I'm, you know, Jeff Bezos was trying to say, I'm obsessed with the desires and wishes and needs of the customers. That's what the customer, the, you know, the clients, the customers need. And the journalist just couldn't get it. You know, it's, the, it's like the same thing in this article. It's on decentralized dot today. Uh, it's called Bitcoin, the internet rock and roll uh, interview and article with, um, or, or um, based on, on David Bowie's art uh, interview in 99. So what's your take on that? I mean, uh, did you read it or, or should I read some quotes out of it? I picked it up a little bit late this morning, so I only got about a third of the way through it. But I, I'd seen that a while back. And, you know, it's, uh, as I was saying we, before we got going, uh, you know, it, it's easy to kind of cherry pick out the, uh, the critics who were, were, were grossly mistaken. You know, the internet will never be more valuable than a fax machine kind of thing. And the critics are right. Um, so predictions hard, especially about the future. Um, so, you know, the people who are, who are right in their predictions are visionary and people are wrong are wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
you know, I, I think at the time in 99, I mean, this was already fairly obvious. So it's a little bit late, you know, to, to be saying, no, the internet's not going to, not going to do these things. I, I you know, I, I remember in the, in the mid nineties thinking, well, you know, when just, just can't wait till it, it's inevitable. Right. Really. Um, but you know, Bowie is seeing this as a, as a, as a way for people to express themselves freely, right? Which implies without censorship. Um, you know, the internet can be censored by the state, but, but there's, you know, it, it's also, it's just a connection of computers to each other. It doesn't require, you know, um, large scale state, you know, controlled um, telecoms to, to really operate. There's other ways, but because they let it operate to a certain extent, that, that's kind of how it operates. Um, but they, you know, there's taxation, uh, from the internet. So that's, that's all fine with the state. You go to a state where free expression is not so valued by the state. It's a, it's a risk. It's heavily censored, right? Is it effective? No, not at all. Um, or not, not highly, right? You go to China, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a pretty heavy handed censor operating in China. Uh, who knows who it is? I don't know, but you can't get to certain sites. And, uh, you know, your VPN and boom, you're there. So um, not so hard, but every once in a while the VPN doesn't work and you're kind of jumping around trying to find your ways around it. So, you know, the internet has, has you know, to the extent that people don't value free expression, it's, it's censored. Um, I don't know. So, so you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see uh, Bowie come, come out and say, and other people come out and say, really, this is, this is an act of rebellion. We're, we're, we're saying, no, we're not going to accept your restrictions and we're going to say what we want. Um, which I think is great. And I think that's exactly what Bitcoin is. It's a, I call it, I, the term I use is it's an act of resistance. Right? Yeah. Let me, let me just, um, just for the sake of context, uh, the interviewer said in that article, and it was 99, he says, uh, you don't think that some of the claims that are being made for it are hugely exaggerated. Uh, you got to read, you know, the article for yourself. I mean, when the telephone was invented, people made amazing claims for it, blah, blah. And then David Boyd interjects, he says, I know the president at that time, he was outrageous. He said he foresaw the day in the future when every town in America will have a telephone. Now that how dare he claim that absolute bullshit in parenthesis sarcasm. So no, I don't agree. I think the internet, I don't think we have even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something accelerating and terrifying, he says. And the interview says, still looking exasperated, is, is it just a tool, isn't it? And David um, interrupts him again and says, no, it's not. No, it's an alien life, life form. <laughs> is there life on Mars? Yes. And he just landed here, you know, as the artist and musician David, like speaking. I found it hilarious. I mean, this, 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 you know, this understanding of what it means structurally, fundamentally for society in, in totality. This is something mm -hmm. I, I don't think mainstream the man, people. The man who created... yeah, well, fell to earth. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it goes to what Eric's saying is that, you know, there's, there's people who try to predict the future, they claim to be visionaries, whether or not they are, we see. But I think the one thing that you can bet on is humans wanting to, humans gravitating towards freedom of expression. And Bitcoin is a form of freedom of expression. You know, the internet is one for exchanging ideas and information freely. <laughs> um, but, you know, Bitcoin is one for communicating and expressing value in a way that was previously restricted to, you know, a few restricted forms of, uh, a few restricted channels that were surveilled and, you know, constantly devalued. So for the first time, we can express uh, our value in an international sense uh, without uh, control by the state. And I think that that is something that, you know, you don't want to bet against something world changing like that. Similar to you don't want to bet against the printing press suddenly allowing uh, people to access knowledge in a way that was previously only controlled by, you know, state-based libraries or something like that, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think that human progress in general is a, a progress towards better and a stronger individual sovereignty and an elaboration of, of what fundamental human rights are. I think that money is going to be... Um, 
something that becomes one of those key human rights that we find to be very, very important in our, our ability to share and communicate and store our, our time and energy. Well, yeah, I, I agree, Connor. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I think, you know, the way that you talk about the printing press, and uh, I'm sure that there were state actors at the time that didn't like the idea of people being able to print their own books, you know, the whole um, who controls the present, or who controls the, the past controls the present. Um, and they, they knew that very well, um, that, that the, the technology went on anyway, and, and eventually, you know, worked itself everywhere. And then the digital printing press, the internet itself, uh, kind of did the same thing. And I'm, they were, you know, they were trying to control it and, and they've, they've realized that there are parts of it they can't really control. And I think now we have the digital monetary printing press uh, and, and there will be governments that try to control it and there will be maybe governments that embrace it. But uh, like you say, it's a, it's a progress of, of tools. I, I think that's actually the smartest thing that the reporter said about the internet, that, that it is really a tool. All, all technology is just different tools. Mm -hmm. And I think when technology really uh prolific expands and, and and evolves that generally technology brings um power to individuals not to you know large nation states i think um so i think we're going in the right direction is what i'm trying to say unfortunate analogy uh uh, the, the the money the digital money printing press you know might be <laughs> um, you know, I, I would uh, I would add a little historical uh, color to the to the to the printing press um, analogy um, at the time um, I mean the first book printed was the Bible right the Gutenberg Bible the printing press and um, at the time the the church the, the Roman the, the Catholic Church um, generally interpreted the Bible for people that's that was the job of a preacher or priest right to, to which was a nation state right which well, is yeah, tied to the states at the time were, they were closely coupled um and mm -hmm. in, in the case of the catholic church it is the state and still runs the vatican state um mm -hmm. and so you know you had this you had this control and you you, you know the, the, the big issue with the reformation began with um well, what's the word uh, paying your way into heaven i forget the the, the, the term for it but um, you know, so, so the idea that you could print your own, you, you could print books cheaply, especially the Bible was very dangerous and the, the printing press was banned. And that was, the, that was the first big step, right? I mean, obviously, well, we'll just ban it and then people won't be able to, to get these Bibles. And, but what it led to is people printing the Bible and people therefore understand, you know, interpreting it themselves and then realizing that, um, you know, some of the things that were being done were not consistent with what was said in the Bible, and that led to the that led to Martin Luther and the um, kind of what right, and it led to a very large scale war in Central Europe with a lot of dead people um, because you know people had to resist that attempt to control um, this new technology. Um, so there are, it is a very proper analogy, and we see that, um, you know, when the state fears that it actually is going to lose control, it starts mattering, then they will act, and the easiest, the first thing to do is to say, well, you can't do that anymore, and then that pushes it to the fringes, but people continue to do it, and they'll actually come out and do something else, right, enforcement, um, and they did. But, you know, technology is a tool, it's kind of hard to put the cat back in the bag, and so it just keeps going, and in that case, um, you know, it did allow people to um, to learn, to, 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 to do what they wanted to do. And, you know, what's the objective of a free society? It's nothing but to be free. It's not to be, I mean, you can say it's to be wealthier, but what is what does it mean to be wealthier? It just means to do what you want, mm -hmm. right? And um, so, so the objective here is not, you know, to create a great payment, to increase GDP or to you know, uh, it is just to allow people to do what they want to do. And who stops that, right? That's just aggression. It's, and it's formalized or, uh, you know, it's formalized in the state. And, you know, modern states tend to draw their power from the people, from the fact that people are ignorant or they, or they, they um, endorse it, right? So we're not just, you know, just fighting this entity of the state. You're really fighting all these other people that, 
don't understand. We just want to get outside of that system and let people do what they want to do. And sure, there was a lot of people that, that, that said, you know, that agreed with the, the church and, and that, you know, interpreting the Bible yourself is not a good thing because the church said so, right? Um, but nevertheless, some people, some individuals decided that was, uh, that, was, that was not the case and they wanted to do what they wanted to do anyway. And the individual right not to be stolen from, right? I mean, isn't it also about, I know it's an overall freedom is the overall expression, but it's about like creation of value, you know, entrepreneurship, property rights. Uh, I mean, we're... The word, fundamental oops. principle of freedom is that not to not be stolen from, right? Exactly, yeah. Right. That yeah, is thank the you. one crime. Yeah, thanks. Comes down to it, right? And aggression is the, is, aggression is how we describe that, that crime of, of, you know, um, stealing from people. Uh, so the state has formalized aggression, and um, a lot of people just don't understand that. What, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that um, the, the, the bulk of individual people even may not even understand or care um, or agree with what a small group of you know, technology people are trying to do, um, but that's okay. I mean, you know, it, it, it takes time for, for people to, to embrace certain you know, new technologies and, and to embrace their own freedom. But somebody has to lead the way, and that's you know that's Gutenberg and all the others that uh, that followed that that persisted in this idea that you know we want to we want to say what we want to say, and just for the, for the fact that we want to, and you know that's what makes us wealthier because it's what we want. Well, that's what I think is really interesting that you know people don't care, and you know I try to talk to my friends about this sometimes, and 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 people are like, yeah, that's interesting, you know, and they just move on with their lives. But what they do care about, it, huh? I remember I'm an old guy. Yeah, you know, they didn't care about the internet, right? They was oh, like, oh, oh, how is that important to me? Right? Totally, Eric. I was I was ten years old and I was on the internet and all my friends were like, Come play outside and I was like, No, you don't understand this. Oh, you're thing. One of those kids. <laughs> oh yes. And and but what's what's really interesting about this is obviously they do care now, you know. And I was I, I was in the second wave of that that, you know, I think in two thousand or whatever, I had a I had the Sony Clie. It was a palm pilot that was very similar to an iPhone today. And I had this computer in my pocket. People are like, why do you have a friggin' computer in your pocket? Like, what's wrong with you? Uh, you know, let's go, let's go play outside. Let's go, let's go get drunk. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. This thing is coming. And of course, you know, again, sure. but, but what they do care about, and that's what's really interesting about Bitcoin, is orange, orange coin number go up. <laughs> People oh, care yeah. about that. And yeah. But what if it doesn't, right? What if it doesn't show? Oh, sure. For sure. Is that is that what's is that what's important? I mean, it's important from a securities perspective, right? But the price on the money important from an incentive perspective. But well, okay. But let's let's assume, and we can we can tell the Bitcoin price does not always go up. Is it okay? Is it now no longer an important technology? No, I'm not saying that. But right. So uh, <laughs> because well, let's say it, let's say it stays at ten thousand for the next twenty years. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> let's, let's, because let's say the, the Bitcoin purchasing power doesn't ever change, right? It stays where it is. Um, is it is I, an important technology? I still think it definitely is important technology. Right. So I, I what I'm we're trying to say is is pinning pinning the hopes of the technology on the on the, on the assumption that it, it always increases in purchasing power faster than um, the return on you know the, the market return on capital, right? Which sure. is you know your the inter, the global interest rate of say eight to 10 percent you know if it, if it always exceeds that then it's valuable otherwise it's not and I, I think that's a that's a gross misconception and um not ideal for the evolution of what we're talking about which is a uh, a system that allows people to trade with less taxation right freely mm -hmm. i think that it, it's it's going to be valuable regardless but i think that a, like the big world changing value of bitcoin would be lost if it just stays stagnant at 10,000. Let's say the market cap today stays where it is. I mean well, the the big goal in in my mind is separating money from the state. And if if that doesn't happen, that will be disappointing for me certainly. <laughs> I mean there's a lot left on the table. Take gold as an example. Pretty stable in purchasing power throughout its history. Very 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 important this money. Um, but with short-term volatility, right? With short-term volatility, short-term. I, I talk yeah. about, yeah. Uh, so because I find these terms to be, you know, these terms are generally financial terms, not economic terms. Yeah. And, and I tend to speak primarily in economic terminology because that's what 
those are the forces that matter. Financial comes down to regulation and, and you know, um, other, other things that are kind of the implementation details. So we talk about stability and volatility as if they're opposites, and they're not. You have volatility and non-volatility, right? The tendency of prices to change. Well, of course, prices change because mm -hmm. prices are subjective. Value is subjective, right? Both on the supplier side and the, you know, demand side of something. And, you know, if you're trading apples for oranges, I mean, who's the supplier and, you know, who's the demander, right? They're, they're trader, trading partners, and, and each has a subjective idea of value. And so, therefore, prices change. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, prices change. You can't eliminate volatility, which is this measured in standard deviation from, from a norm, right? You have higher and lower volatility. But stability is, is a different concept, right? Stability in the engineering sense is a tendency of something, when disturbed, to return to equilibrium. It's not a standard deviation from a norm. So I, I separate these two concepts. And again, this is my terminology because... These are two se separate ideas that need different words. So I, I have to explain it so that people know what I'm talking about. But stability in my, uh, in my description is the tendency um, of, in this case of money, to return to some norm. Now the norm can change, but gold has had a very strong tendency to be stable, um, as has just about every other thing that exists in the world, right? Because of the law of supply and demand. When, when price rises because of, say, rising demand, supply tends to increase, therefore stabilizing price volatility, right? Deviations from that norm that we can measure with, with standard deviation. But that returning to the norm is a consequence of, um, of the fact that more can be produced when more is demanded. So that's gold is subject to those forces, and that's why it, um, like just about everything else. Now, Bitcoin is unique um, mm -hmm. in some way in that it, its supply can't be increased when demand increases. So people look at that simple idea and say, well, it's unstable, right? Now, you don't, you don't, you think I'm talking about volatility, but I'm not. I'm talking about the idea that it will always rise. That's instability. It doesn't return to a norm when there's a, when the, you know, the idea is of, of instability, of rising forever, uh, is that it's not returning to some norm. So, what people miss in that calculus is that even though Bitcoin has a uh, limited supply, right, never can be exceeded, it has other things that no other commodity in the world or thing in the world has, which are integrated fees, right? There's no mm -hmm. integral fee. When, when a lot of people are trading gold, the price of me handing you a piece of gold does not go up. But with Bitcoin, it does. So the more transaction demand there is, the more costly it becomes to transact, which is a negative uh, pressure on demand, which produces stability. So I, 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 you know, Bitcoin is ultimately stable because of that, but for a different reason than gold and everything else. Um, so I, I believe it's fairly obvious from that, that that Bitcoin is not an unstable money, which is a good thing, right? Unstable money is not ideal money. You want it to have fairly consistent purchasing power over time. Of course, we have a phase we're going through where, you know, fees are still low enough that they're fairly inconsequential, but we've seen points in time when they're not. Mm -hmm. And that has possibly caused people to, you know, draw back their demand. And that, uh, we saw that when, the, when we hit the 20,000 spike, fees got extraordinary. And that was the subject on everybody's mind. So I, I believe ultimately that Bitcoin has volatility like everything else but it's also stable, which is what we want. And we can't presume that its value is based on um, creating some kind of a rational uh, return on capital. It's irrational that you could perpetually, uh, re you know, return, create a return on your investment that exceeds market arbitrage would, would destroy that. Yeah, I'd also add to that, that you know, you said what, what this conjecture about Bitcoin price going up forever well what are you measuring it against right you're measuring against the the tool that everybody measures prices against the u.s dollar right well, I mean, so or, or are you measuring against goods themselves purchasing power of goods right so we, how we measure that's important too and uh i also I, I i do love your conjecture about this um about the 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 fees being uh you know uh, a, a 
pre like a, a downward pressure on on the price and I, I think that makes a lot of sense but also as bitcoin scales uh you know there's there's segwit there's uh, block size increases that are possible there's uh lightning network there's so liquid and and, and probably other scaling solutions that will happen too point, right but, right and I, for and sure I've for sure explicitly said that something like layering right um has this effect of potentially of increasing the amount of transaction throughput without increasing uh, level of fees. However, um, that's a new, equil new equilibrium point, but it also implies that you're trading something to get there, right? You're trading localized yes. security in something like Lightning um, for this. And you can, you can trade even further and you can go to Coinbase and trade completely off chain, right? And, and a lot of ways to achieve this, but they all, they all um, qualify as a, as a trade-off. And in, in, even in those cases, the fees push back up into those additional layers. So you're getting less security mm -hmm. and you're still getting the fees. And so eventually you hit, the, you hit another um, in a trade-off sure. for, um, again, localized security. What you want to avoid from a, from a technology standpoint is you want to avoid system-wide trade-offs in security, right? Um, so, I mean, they're, they're always made. Any block size, for example, is a trade-off, right? And you can make it you can make it big enough so now it can't be you can't operate at small scale and now you've made a significant trade off in security for transaction throughput which is uh, oddly what Satoshi su uh, suggested at one point right that we just centralize all the mining and uh, and therefore we get a lot of transaction throughput with a lot of volume um, so yeah you, you're going to reach this point where you have a you know kind of a sustainable acceptable level of trade off in the black market where you can still operate and you get a certain level of throughput and you have a certain equilibrium that's been reached in, due to fees um, if you take take lightning for example there's a lot of assumptions about it that I, I don't well at least some that don't seem to hold up right you open a channel you have to be able to close that channel for it to be secure which means you have to be able to confirm your transaction on chain right. but you have to pay the fee so just to open the channel you have to be willing to pay the current fee, mm -hmm. All right? What if the current fee is, you know, purchasing power a thousand dollars? You're going to do a micro transaction. You're going to open that transaction, right? So the fees are real, even though you can imagine amortizing them over a large number of transactions. You have to be willing to risk them just to start. So yeah, they don't they don't disappear they altogether, right? Amortization, and then there's the real effect of opening. So these are these are these are things that don't go. Is what I'm suggesting. One thing I want to add on the volatility point, I think that, you know, the volatility, like Eric was saying, is it's just a function of its, its true scarcity. And the fact that the price shifts so dramatically is more a result in, you know, it, it demonstrates Bitcoin's ability to accurately signal subjective valuation, right? And that's what's so important about a monetary base and what's so unique to Bitcoin is that because the supply is truly capped, then we can have the most accurate base possible really for um, pri a pricing system to be built on top of it. Because even when you have a, a monetary system like gold, which doesn't have a true cap, and when the price of gold per ounce increases, then you can have uh, supply distortions, right? Because suddenly mining is more profitable, more gold hits the, more gold supply hits the market uh, because it's more valuable suddenly because more people are using it. There's industrial uses of gold that create their own distortions in, in, in prices that are priced in gold. Um, so with Bitcoin, it's pure uh, monetary object. It has a pure cap. And so the volatility is, is really just a direct function of, of subjective valuation changing and then can build a much more stable monetary base at the bottom. And I think that if, if we're really concerned about volatility, the, the terrifying volatility is the volatility you see when you have a financial system built on a soft money. You know, like the, the bubbles and the bursts that we're seeing in the global financial system, 2008 being one example, who knows what the next one's going to be, uh, is really terrifying volatility because it's a, it, it's a systemic distortion in price at the very bottom, a mispricing of risk. Um, that leads to mispricing all throughout the economy and then suddenly results in extreme volatility and just destruction of people's wealth that they, they really thought they had. And so when you build a foundation on something like Bitcoin, 
then you can have a much more accurate representation of price and a, a much better functioning economy. You'll still have some credit, um, you know, crises back and forth, but you're not going to have a systemic price distortion that can really cause terrifying volatility, I think. Yeah, I mean, wait, you're, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, the, you know, the idea that a big shock, which is right, you're referring to, say, a, a huge, this happened with silver, right, when the Comstock load was discovered in uh, Virginia City, um, you know, the silver price uh, dropped, and, and, you know, I don't know if it ever recovered. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, or the, the gold supply shock when the, I forget his name, you know, the richest man that ever lived, uh, took his gold to, to uh, Mecca um, and, and was trying to help everybody out by buying everything, you know, in sight. Um, you know, the purchasing power of gold dropped dramatically for an extended period of time. Um, so those are, those are supply shocks and, and Bitcoin is not subject to supply shock, but price is a function of supply and demand. And this is, this comes back to the, the stability property I was talking about. Demand also uh, ha, ha, can have the same effect on price. So Bitcoin is subject to demand shock. And, and we, a great example of this would be, say, a global ban in the white market or a large scale one, right? That's a demand shock, a big one. So um, there are, or, or things like Facebook announcing it's going to make a shit coin, right? There's a demand shock, um, uh, an increase uh, versus a decrease, but still um, uh, volatility. Uh, so you have a you have a stable stable money that is subject to volatility nonetheless. Better to not have supply shock, sure. But what we're, what we're really talking about is elimination of the tax cost uh, of the money, um, and that is really only possible in the black market. So you have a the benefits you're describing, I think, do exist. I mean, there is a benefit to no you know. To, to not having supply shocks uh, in the in the black market um, where it where it can and will operate, um, but the idea that it will be some sort of perfect money or ideal money in the in the um, in the cent uh, what's his name Nash Nash yeah the ideal money in the Nash I, I I think I think that's all kind of a fantasy that everybody will peg everything to this idea of a, of a global ideal money. I mean, even the idea of a peg is, is silly. Who controls the peg, right? So um, uh, better money, uh, a lower tax money, you know, permissionless to the extent that we can pay for it. Yeah, definitely. But certainly not, not ideal in that sense. Not, not, maybe more ideal, but not perfectly ideal. All right. Well, I think... I think there won't, I don't know. I, I, I have a, I have a hard time not, I have a hard time imagining a world where money doesn't converge after Bitcoin now. And so uh, in the short term, yes, but maybe 50 years from now, why would there be multiple monies? Um, and why wouldn't the demand for, if Bitcoin is the global money, then demand would be relatively constant because everyone wants money. I mean, demand for money doesn't, if it's the global money, it wouldn't really change. Um, yeah, I lost my... The... Yeah, I was saying, so, so, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of alluding to Gresham's law, right? The, uh, the in a, in a, or, or Thier's law, which is the inverse of Gresham's law. Gresham's law says everybody uses the shitty money because it's price controlled. Uh, in, in, the, in the presence of exchange controls, people use the... Right. The, the, the crappier money, the one that's subject to inflation, et cetera, and they, they hoard the better money. But Thier's law is just is, is, is when you remove the idea of um, exchange controls, which is what we're kind of presuming in Bitcoin, right? When there's no exchange controls, then everybody uses the better money. It's cheaper. Um, well, those exchange controls don't go away in the white market, right? They go away in the black market. So you, this is one of the reasons why I describe <laughs> Bitcoin as black market money. That's where you get the benefit. Um, you go into the white market and now you're, you're, you're on your passport photo to be able to trade. Um, therefore your transactions are monitored. Therefore you're paying those taxes. Um, you may be only able to trade using fed coin in the white market, which is subject to inflation. Right? So, so, um, people will converge on the best money possible in the absence of, of, um, of exchange controls. But in the presence of them, they'll use the worst money possible because its price is, is um, controlled 
So it's it's truly sure. valuable, and so people want to want to spend it and they want to hoard the stuff that's more valuable. Um, so yeah, convergence implies I, I, a global free market, right? Without that, what Gresham's law implies is that there it won't converge. So you could imagine. I, I use this when I describe. Um, you know, various altcoins. And when I talk about Bitcoin, I'm not talking about BTC. I'm, I'm talking about anything that conforms to the rules that that uh, this, that secure Bitcoin that are laid out by Satoshi in the white paper because he coined the term Bitcoin. Um, and you could have any number of Bitcoins that have redundant value proposition, right? They're basically the same. And you would expect those to converge because there's no reason to suffer an exchange cost between them, right? Now, there may become a reason, um, and, you know, that, that we see that, say, gold, silver, platinum, other commodity monies that get used even in the black market, right? There's different reasons to use different ones because they don't have the exact same value proposition. They have different characteristics, heavier, different colors, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, it's possible that you could have multiple Bitcoins that exist concurrently because they have different value propositions. Um, it's you know, provable that if they don't, they will converge. Um, but in the presence of foreign exchange controls, um, you're still going to see that divergence um, due to Gresham's law. Which is why I think it, Bitcoin is so interesting because it, it is the most resistant to capital controls. Right. Well, let that sink yeah, in. Yeah. That I mean, that'll just... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, guys, we gotta wrap this. I don't want to, you know, overload my listeners too much uh, because this is like amazing session today. Um, just uh, either one or two or both questions. If you still have time, I know Ben, you gotta go, right? Um, you you gotta go. You said you had like okay. Let me just um, one question is okay. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that was, uh, could have set the fixed supply with 21 million, 15 million. All right. So it's not about the amount. It's like the it's got to be absolute scarcity, right? The absolute fixed limited supply. Now, there's this talk about, you know, speculation about how many coins already lost could have been lost because of death, uh, pri you know, lost private keys and stuff. And I don't want to speculate. But Boating accidents. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what would be if I let's just let's just, you know, just for the sake of simplicity, let's just say really like two million or four million coins. You know, finally lost. Uh, what what does it mean? I, I think I could never figure out what what does, is that a fundamental meaning to it? Um, no, Mar Rothbard talks about this in total know, circulation. Any, you know, I mean, it, yeah. But and any any supply of money is is will work just fine as long as there's divisibility. So it doesn't matter what the number is. Yes, the twenty one million is what we always talk about. But whatever that number ends up being, uh, it doesn't matter. I think the the fact that some are getting lost actually means that. The, the supply is, can, you know, would be contracting from that 21 million, but uh, over time, I believe that that will probably taper off to be a very small number. <laughs> no, because there's this quote from Satoshi Nakamoto uh, in some of the his correspondence. He says, uh, "Well, yes, if if some of the coins are lost, the the value of those coins sort of." I don't know what's the word of it. Converge or, or transfer to the value of the other coin holders. Is, remember, Eric or Connor, Ben. Remember, there's a yeah. quote like. Well, I, I think uh, that one one thing I've been thinking about in relation to this lately is if let's say quantum computing does come online, mm -hmm. which you know it's debatable. Some people don't even think it's ever going to exist. But if it does exist, and let's say we 20 years from now add quantum resistant signatures to Bitcoin, everyone moves their coins to quantum resistant key or keys. Uh, if there are 4 million coins lost, those coins aren't going to move to quantum resistant keys. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, a Bitcoin does what we think it's going to do and it you know, continues becoming this global reserve asset, then whichever nation state or group achieves quantum first is going to be like the wealthiest group in the world. I mean, it's, it's going to be has potential to be like wild, right? And, and maybe the next world superpower is the one who gets quantum first and unlocks the keys. <laughs> um, because the, if, they, if they are truly lost, then they're going to be uh, exposed to quantum attacks. And that's something that, that uh, a good thing to think about. I, I, was, I was 
I haven't really talked about this other people. I'm curious what other people think about it's this. A, it's an interesting observation that, that, that lost coins that can't be converted will be consumed and converted by somebody, who, by the first person who's able to, uh, to break the keys. Um, and I think that's, it's a, that's a very reasonable assumption. Um, although, you know, uh, it's hard to say, you know, that, that price is also not affected by such a scenario. Uh, so in terms of actual value, but relative value, and you know, somebody's going to pick up a lot of coins uh, once they can convert those keys. And that's, if we assume quantum computing is inevitable, then it's inevitable that if one entity gets it first, that they can then go collect all the lost coins. I, I believe that's a very true statement. Yeah. And then you have a massive incentive <laughs> when then uh, like a trillion dollar asset, then you have massive incentive to just throw billions of dollars in quantum research to be the first one to get it like a race to quantum. Absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come like, on guys. That, net, that's like 20, 30 years, sorry. right? I mean, that's would be like a realistic scenario in like, uh, is that true? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Well, maybe it's DARPA yeah. already working on it, but uh, um, it's like, you know, these time frames, you know, like 20, 30 years usually, or, or is it going to be faster because of the exponential rate of pace of technology? Anyway, it's just speculation. But let's assume it's inevitable, right? It's, it's, I mean, I, I believe it's inevitable that computing will continue to increase in power, right? Mm. Uh, Satoshi made that fairly clear as well, like, you know, in terms of invoking Moore's law to describe the you know, necessary, the, the ability to continue to store the chain even. So let's assume it's possible. Then the, then the, I think the, uh, the conclusion is correct that somebody, I mean, maybe it'll happen concurrently and, you know, but, but if, but if I was doing it, I would have, I would have tried to figure out where all those lost coins are up front and then just did it all at once. And, you know, a few seconds I've, I've got, I've transitioned all those coins to now, uh, resistant uh, outputs. So, um, but you know, another economic principle that that observed is that um, having an having an individual that's very wealthy, um, you know, is presumed to be perpetual, and, and generally wealth tends to dissipate pretty quickly, because having wealth is not having money is is not wealth until you spend it. Right? You, you don't have the things you want until you spend the money. So wealthy people tend to spend a lot of money, and uh, you know they uh, they if if they if they don't invest it they tend, wisely they tend to lose it all. Um, mm -hmm. And holding Bitcoin is not investment. That's that's another kind of commonly held fallacy. It's hoarding, right? It, it's it's, hoarding. it's not it's not a, a cause of production. It doesn't produce anything, which means it doesn't produce any return. This idea that price always rises, which we've already discussed, is speculatory which means it's a zero sum game uh, ultimately, unless you have an unstable money, which all that means is that everybody jumps in until the speculative game again. So, um, you know, the idea that you, you have all this purchasing power, but you never use it, so that's kind of irrelevant. And when you start using it either to maintain it, which means investing, which means you give it to somebody else for some period of time, uh, you know, it tends to dissipate money pretty quickly. And we, you know, we see this in, um, nation states or countries or regions where, you know, say the king of England has, a, has, has amassed incredible wealth because, you know, the sun never sets, sets on, the, uh, on the English, on the UK empire. Um, but, you know, eventually that dissipated over time. Um, and uh, so it's not necessarily a doomsday scenario is all I'm describing, right? Somebody having a, a large amount or something. These shit Satoshi's got a large yeah. amount. You know, if he wanted to start spending it, what would that mean? It just mean that other people have it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would argue the, the current system is far worse because I, I believe through asset inflation that the wealthy disproportionately gain from inflation while the, the poor have no store of values. Yeah, that's so because that's where the, the money's far pumped. worse because it, it keeps those people on well, top. You hold your, it you keeps hold the your people on top. In cash, you pay the inflation tax. And wealth, wealthy hold a sure. percentage of their capital in cash if they're smart because um, because they don't want to pay that tax, right? So they want to get market. And they can afford to. They can afford to hold illiquid yes. vaults of store value assets. Percentage asset. of your of your net worth is is not um, can being consumed and therefore not held in cash. So yeah, inflation tends to hit, um, you know, and, and things in taxes tend to hit um, lower income people. Um, more significantly. Um, so, but, 
but I'm talking about this this paradigm today of you know there's this there's push for socialism to redistribute the wealth because of all the robber barons have amassed too much capital and that they're they're the problem the billionaires all of my you know people that I know that are are young or not all of them but um, a lot of them are saying oh it's these rich billionaires yeah. that are the problem and I I think it's the system that's keeping them on top that's the problem mm-hmm. not the fact that they're rich right? I mean this is the road to serve that's them, what I'm trying to get right at. I mean that's that's what that's Hayek's idea that the more government intervention that tries to uh, remedy these wrongs is just going to lead to more problems and distribution. And, you know, it, it's like stratification. the running cycle. Hmm. Economy is not a zero sum game. It doesn't matter that somebody's wealthier than you, right? That, that doesn't hurt you in any way. Um, it's when people use aggression against you that, that it hurts you in terms of being free or not being free. Somebody has money and they want to hire you to do something and you're perfectly willing to do that. Do it. I mean, that's, it doesn't hurt you. Um, so just the idea that there's a there's an inherent evil in in some being some people being much wealthier than other people is is itself a fallacy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's not it's a non wrong. It, when we're and I think you seem to agree on that. Fact that. You know when the state intervenes and tries to either correct these wrongs or maybe not, right? <laughs> that's when you it, it, you tend to get these greater disproportions. But the disproportion itself is not the problem. People are not all the same. Right not all going to value the same things in terms of their time and what they, what they do and you know, how much they save. Um, equality is not a goal. And a, and a fair system should be a goal. Well, the only definition of fairness is everybody trades freely. Right. <laughs> all right. Concluding, uh, final question. Um, Libra, Calibra, Facebooks, whatever, global coin, surveillance coin, what do you want to call it? Is it going to smooth and facilitate, accelerate the, the, the consciousness of people understanding, questioning the essence of money and, 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 and just you know, being attracted to Bitcoin finally? Is it going to facilitate that? I think it definitely will have some... I, I think it definitely is, is moving uh, to you know, the, the public consciousness away from money has to be controlled by states. Um, now, it, it is backed by assets that are, you know, controlled by state actors. So in some ways, it's not moving that far away. I think it, it is a good thing in that sense that it's it's showing, com- cur- I think if anything, it'll prove the value prop of Bitcoin. Um, because, you know, you have to ask yourself a question with Libra. Will you be able to send $10,000 to Iran? If yes, then it's going to be shut down by regulators. And if no, <laughs> then it's PayPal, right? Yeah. And so either way, it's going to prove Bitcoin's value prop. I, you know, maybe it'll help people in remittances. But um, yeah, I, I think it's net good. It'll be interesting to see how regulators treat it. The only concern I would have is that maybe this pulls the... Uh, maybe this... Um, demonstrates to politicians that there is a threat to their monopoly on central banking uh, sooner than we would like. Um, Because right now they're not treating Bitcoin seriously, but if they treat Facebook very seriously as a threat to their power, you know, it doesn't take much to look a little bit further down the line and realize Bitcoin is the real threat the entire time. So I don't know. It it brings up a lot of interesting questions. We'll see what happens with regulators. Yep. Thank you so much. Which also goes to Eric's point. Mm-hmm. Eric's point about that, you know, Bitcoin isn't just BTC. It's it's this this movement of of non sovereign monies, and and that you know they oh they smash down Libra, up oh, they smash down Bitcoin, and then you know what's what's next? I mean, it's it's very hard to put this cat back in the bag. Uh, that, I mean, Libra has been discussed ad nauseum, but I think you know Con- Connor's point about that it forces people to think about you know non state money and and what the implications of that are. It's it's like getting people to finally care about what we've been talking about, right? When we said, oh, they'll, they'll only care when orange coin number goes up. Well, this is a way to make them be like, huh, what's going on here? Why is Libra, is it just PayPal or is it, are they actually creating a brand new money? And, and that starts the conversation. And I think that's a be having this conversation. As Eric says, we can't know the future. Um, so let's talk about what, you know, what this new paradigm really means. My, my opinion is just PayPal, but, um, and that's really all you have to say about it. <laughs> But, uh, uh, and, uh, and to fill in a hole I left before, the term I was looking for with respect to the church and, and, uh, um, and, the, and the Reformation was indulgences, right? The idea that you, you, pay, you pay some tax to the church and you get your way into heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know, uh, 
great talk. I uh, always enjoy it. Me too. Thank you so much. I enjoyed so much and I learned so much. I'm sure my listeners did and very enlightening, very deep and very, you know, uh, really, you know, from every facet. I think we've, we've covered a lot of facets. <laughs> and that's always good. So a pretty holistic picture. Um, yeah. Uh, well, guys, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, Eric, um, Connor, Ben, and hopefully talk to you soon, maybe in a different constellation or same constellation, different topics. Uh, people enjoy that so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, if you love this interview, this panel discussion, um, don't forget, security comes first. Get yourself a Trezor wallet. There are some other you know, applications, easy cheesy, you know, user-friendly applications. Uh, I'm not being sponsored, all right, at least not yet by them, but you know, go to serious, credible, trustworthy exchanges such as Kraken. I'm a huge fan of them. Their ethos, their professionalism, their up-to-date, top-notch security updates, whatever, their communication style. Uh, Amber, Dropbit, um, uh, Trezor. Uh, these are, you know, I have personal experiences with these products and uh, support me, like this video, share this video, subscribe, uh, push the notification bell button, uh, follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, social media, Facebook, uh, on my podcast, on my website, kvandavani.com. Support me in any shape or form you can, because this keeps the independence, uh, you know, the the flow, the speed, and, you know, the educational purpose behind this, all right, this whole thing behind this, uh, uh, the Total Connector show. All right, my name is Kevin Navani. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for watching.